Did you know? The Super Nintendo was able to stay afloat in the 32-bit age as a 16-bit console thanks to features like the SFX chip in Mode 7? The term Mode 7 is often applied to SNES games that twist and scale images to make things like the sprawling worlds of Final Fantasy possible. Mode 7 is actually the 8th graphics mode that the SNES uses for handling images. Modes 0 through 6 are pretty similar and offer effects for backgrounds, most commonly used to apply parallax in games. But it was Mode 7's ability to apply perspective effects on images that made it popular. Mode 7 could take an image up to 128 by 128 pixels with 256 colors and through mathematical transformations create the illusion of distance, perfect for large overworlds or race courses. Variations on Mode 7 allow some parts of backgrounds to be displayed in front of sprites. In Super Mario Kart's Rainbow Road and Ghost Valley, the track can be rendered in front of the player should they fall off. And in Stage 2 of Contra 3, The Alien Wars, characters can pass under parts of the rotating background. Mode 7 was not without its limitations, however, the largest being that the effects could only be applied to background images and not sprites. In Super Castlevania, the developers got around this issue when rendering the boss Coronaut. Coronaut was instead loaded in as a background image to give him the scaling and twisting effects. Notice how the fight takes place in front of a black screen, or no background, and how he passes behind the block platforms on the edges of the screen. Also notice that because he's a background image and not a sprite, he isn't able to have the HUD overlaid on top of him like the main character. Since objects like pipes or other racers in Super Mario Kart or F-Zero are sprites and can't be scaled, a single object had multiple sprite sizes to be swapped out as the player approached them. Notice how the racer's size pops in, smaller or larger, depending on their distance, rather than smoothly scaling. It wasn't until the Super FX chip that sprites could be scaled. Back in 1993, a studio named Argonaut Games collaborated with Nintendo to create what would be Star Fox, codenamed then Nest Glider. During development, CEO of Argonaut Games, Jez San expressed to Nintendo that the game was as good as it could get, unless they were allowed to design custom hardware to allow the SNES to handle 3D. Nintendo gave the green light, and Argonaut developed the SFX chip, codenamed the Mathematical Argonaut Rotation and I.O. chip, or Mario chip. Because the chip would be a modification to the cartridges, it was joked among the developers that the SNES was just a box that held a real horsepower inside the cartridge. The SFX chip was pretty revolutionary, and while cartridges that included it were more expensive, it made the likes of Star Fox and Yoshi's Island possible. Compared to the millions of polygons that modern day games can render, the SFX chip allotted a number in the order of hundreds, and without textures. In Star Fox, developers got around this limitation by making objects like lasers, asteroids, and explosion effects scaled images rather than polygons. Sprite deformation was a hugely used feature of the chip in Yoshi's Island. Enemies could rotate programmatically, squash, stretch, and morph smoothly, and it looked Awesome! Another enhancement was the SA-1, or Super Accelerator 1 chip. This thing was a beast, nearly tripling clock speed, improving RAM, and affording memory compression. Thanks to the SA-1 chip, epic games like Super Mario RPG and Kirby Superstar could fit into a cartridge. Nintendo wasn't the only ones to develop special in-cartridge chips. Capcom included its own CX-4 chip in the cartridges of Mega Man X2 and X3. This chip allowed for wireframe objects to be rendered and manipulated on screen. As seen with the intros to both games, some mini-bosses, and Sigma's floating head. A wireframe test screen can even be accessed in both games by holding B on the second controller as the game starts up. The CX4 chip made the SNES the only true 16-bit console able to play X2 and X3, and the same can be said of the Super FX chip enabling the SNES to play Doom, albeit an inferior version. It was through clever use of onboard hardware and the inclusion of graphics boosting chips that kept the SNES afloat as a 16-bit console in the 32-bit age, and tied Nintendo over until the release of the N64. That's all for now, but don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Make sure you also check out DidYouKnowGaming.com, and if you like this video, make sure to check out our other videos, or some of my work. I'm the artist for The Bridge on Steam and XBLA. And if you're craving an all-new experience on Wii U, check out my Kickstarter campaign for Hex Heroes, a party RTS game.